Um, today's um, text is the second lesson, which comes from uh, the book of Jude, which is deep, deep in the New Testament. And he starts out, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother James. By the way, Jude is only one chapter long. This is a very short letter, you know, like an email. <laughs> And um, Jude was uh, called Judas, but we know it wasn't Iscariot. Um, he calls, so he's called Jude or Thaddeus. And he's, um, it says here, um, brother of James, brother of James, not James and John. They were the sons of Zebedee, but uh, James, the brother or cousin of Jesus. So Jude himself was a brother or cousin of the Lord Jesus, and he was a servant. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, that's you. And then he gives this benediction before he actually starts his letter. He says, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So he wants you to have those wonderful spiritual qualities which you have, but he wants you to have them in abundance, multiplied, like Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fish to feed 5,000 people. Not skimpy either, they had leftovers. So may you have leftovers, Jude says to you, his modern day listeners, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And then he goes about to write his letter, but he switches gears because he says early in his letter, in his verses, I was going to write to you the story of salvation which you already know. And what's the story of salvation? Jesus died on the cross. Jesus, the Son of God, died on the cross to wash away your sins and mine. What is sin? It's an old-fashioned concept in this modern age, but it's still very real. I think it was Billy Graham who said, if the Bible didn't teach the doctrine of sin, we'd have to make it up to explain the terrorist attacks in Paris. Mm -hmm the terrorist attacks in Mali, Mali, the divorce that we see, the brokenness that we see. So the story of salvation is God took care of that by sending his son Jesus. He said, I was going to write you that story, which you know, to keep you firm in the faith. But he says, I'm going to switch gears because these are the end times. You know, this is deep into the, in the New Testament. There's only one book after Jude. What is it? Revelation, right, Revelation, which is a revelation of heaven. The apostolic age is almost coming to a close. So Jesus has resurrected, ascended into heaven. The 12 apostles and St. Paul, 13, huh, have started building the church or the Holy Spirit birthed the church. And the apostles, those 13 in particular, is on their shoulders which fell the responsibility of planting the church. And Paul was especially good at it because he got out of Imperial Valley and he went everywhere. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, but these guys are just about live their lives, many of which tradition has that they were cut short because of their ambassadorship and their... So Jude is writing a letter to those, the next generation who don't have the earthly Jesus and who don't have Peter to talk to and who don't have Paul to listen to. So he's encouraging them and he says there's going to be trouble. In fact, there's trouble already and part of the trouble is not just persecution but it's internal and part of the trouble is you got guys coming in who changed the gospel, who changed the story of salvation, who changed the interpretation the interpretation of what it means to be a Christian. And, these, and he, he wants to say, don't buy into that. And he's saying the same thing to you and to me. We're in the last days and there will be internal voices which will say, and one in particular was, um, they said, oh, well, now that our sins are forgiven, we can do anything we want. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I've heard a lot of people say that, and they say it, and they're kind of like, ha, 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 but I, they're kind of ha, 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 serious. They're kind of like, I could just, I can bail out on my spouse whenever I want. Oh, my sins are forgiven. Huh? I can tie one on whenever I want. Hmm? My sins are forgiven, right? I can do whatever, and the big one was, of course, sexual immorality. So I can sleep with anybody I want. 
ha, 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 ha. My sins are forgiven. And Jude says, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about that. He says, so our text for today in verse 20, he says, but you, uh, verse 20, not 20. Help me out, where am I? What is it, 20 to 25? There it is. But you, that's where our text starts, the epistle. But you, beloved, you're not, you're my friends. You're my friends. You cling, you cling to the Lord Jesus and you interpret the fact of being saved in a different way. And here's my illustration for today. Some of these are kind of weak, but you'll work with me, right? You'll work with me, right? So, so uh, you are God's friends. So here's my kind of analogy, my parable. I tell my wife, oop, I did the wrong one first. We're going to Hawaii. And she says, yeah, really? She usually says, we can't afford that. And I said, too late, I booked the trip. We're going to Hawaii. And she says, okay. And I say, yay. So we get on the plane. And we go to Honolulu, and we get off the plane. And she says, I need a new dress. I need a new, new dress. We're in Hawaii. When in Hawaii do what Hawaiians do? And they buy these floral, floral dresses. This represents what happened at your baptism. You're now a child of God. You have clothed on Jesus Christ. You're not in the kingdom of darkness anymore. You're in the kingdom of light. You belong to God. You are not your own. You need a dress. So even your parents might have brought you to the waters of baptism and imposed upon you the righteousness of Christ. Thank God for that. I know it's not popular in this day and age to make decisions for your kids or your grandkids. But, but if it's for their good, you do it. Right? Where's Nicholas? Is he still here? Hey, Nicholas, did you want to go to kindergarten? My point is that he may have wanted to go to kindergarten, but mom and dad said, you're going to school. Your mom. And if you chose this later, that's fine. So you're, you're in paradise, okay? And that's why um, Jude calls us friends. We're not of this world. So he starts out, he says, but you, dear friends, build yourself up in the most holy faith. So you build on this, and she builds on it. I said, well, we got to go check into our hotel before we go shopping. She says, no, we don't. <laughs> She's ready to get going. So we talked about this last week. So if we're going to build ourselves up in faith, we not only put on Christ, we put on we take on behaviors that keep us strong and close to Christ that God enjoys. So we add accessories. Well, one accessory that you need while you're in Hawaii, where did I put them? Oh, hang on. Oh, let's make this easy. You need a hat. You need a hat. So we build on what Jane builds on, her Hawaiian outfit, and we build on ours. We build ourselves up in the most holy faith. You read the word. You listen to preachers that are Bible-based and Christ-centered. You know your Bibles well enough so if somebody from the pulpit says something, that doesn't ring true, you know about it, and you build yourself up in, in the holy faith, the faith of the apostles, who constantly preached about Jesus' death for sin and resurrection, not for himself. So you need to hear that over and over again so you're on solid ground. You build yourself up in the holy faith. And the next accessory then, that's my parable today, is you pray in the Holy Spirit. You pray in the Holy Spirit. Do you ever come to church and abandon the visiting for a few minutes? And you get yourself into the sanctuary 
And even though the service hasn't started and you've got some dead time, you pray for the Holy Spirit. You pray that the pastor's sermon makes sense and talks to you. That's praying for the Holy Spirit. You pray for ears that listen. You pray for patience and quiet to let the Spirit talk to you and build yourself up in the holy faith. You can do that in your prayer life too. You pray for the Holy Spirit to help you pray. In fact, there's a passage in the Bible that says you let the Holy Spirit pray for you because sometimes you don't have the words to render your problems or your dilemmas. You don't have the words. The Holy Spirit does. He uses groanings. He doesn't even use words. So that's the next accessory. Now here I did this back. All right, the third accessory is you keep yourselves in God's love. Keep yourselves in God's love. So when Jane says, we're in Hawaii. I need some, yeah, I did this kind of backwards. I need some, I need some shells. What she really wants is one of them flower things. Yeah, I didn't get one of those. Okay, so we're going to make this work. So you keep yourself in God's love. I thought, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Somebody says you keep yourself reminded on John 3:16. For God so loved the world. I didn't love the world. The only person the only thing I love is myself. That's not God's love. You keep yourself in God's love. God gave me food and shelter. God gave me life. God gives me forgiveness. God gives me employment, things like that. God gives me a pious spouse, good children and things like that. So we do that, we, we, we wallow in, not ego, but in God. All right, so we're doing this, we're interpreting it, what it means to be saved, helping it along a little bit to prepare ourselves for when God comes to take us home. All right, I'm reading out of the bulletin, okay? And then uh, you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. But by, while you're waiting, you do, you do these things, kind of like you're doing now. All right, then it says, be merciful. Then it, then it kind of switches gears because it says, be merciful to those who doubt. Someone put it this way. Christianity is not just defensive. Hmm? It's not just protecting ourselves from the big bad world, right? But it's also offensive. When you watch the football game this afternoon, who are you going to support, Don? Cowboys from Texas? How are they doing? Uh, regardless, regardless, the Cowboys are going to have to have defense and they're going to have to have offense. The same way with Christian. You do these things for ourselves to walk close with the Lord, but you're also proactive. You do things that God himself would do. And that says, be merciful to those who doubt. Do you know that sometimes? Do you know, do you know that in this room right now there are people who, who doubt? Who doubt about forgiveness? Who doubt about God's act? Who might even doubt about God's existence? I find, I find the devil sows seeds of doubt most, in my experience, when Christians end up in the hospital. When Christians end up in the hospital, that's why it's a high priority for me. If you end up in the hospital, you, if you end up in the hospital, it's, I see, it seems to me this person is under the assault of the devil and the faith because of their illness. I better get there. So we need to be merciful to those who doubt or any other time. Reach out to others when you leave this morning and this person looks kind of down. They're, the devil's assailing them with doubts. Give them that holy hug and things like that. All right, next, um, next accessory. Well, we're in on the beach in Waikiki. I was going to put these up here. Jane's real cool. She didn't really wear the sunglasses. She wears it up here. Okay, but you get the idea. Let's associate that with snatch others from the fire and save them. That's proactive. 
So a, a Christian congregation, us, we're not just about ourselves, according to the text. We're about reaching others who are uh, close to the fire. Close to the fire. How can you tell that? No, I don't know. You know, if someone's always, always drinking over the weekend, or cheating on his wife, or she on her husband, right, or uh, doesn't have God in their lives, you can kind of see it. And you might be the only person close enough to say something. To say something. Now, you're not going to say, you're going to go to hell. Huh? But you could say, you know, I'm troubled by some of your, some of the things I see. I love you, kid. Let's, let's go to God. Something like that. All right, so we need just a few more. All right. And to show, and to others show mercy mixed with fear. What do we make that? Well, when you go to, let's finish this up. When you go to Waikiki, where are you going to end up? I mean, when you go to Honolulu, where are you going to end up? Besides the mall, the beach. So you need this. Oh, it's going to fall down. And you need a beach mat, and you need a beach towel, and the sand gets hot. Okay. It's fortified. All right. To others show mercy, which kind of sounds the same, mixed with fear. I think the fear has you show mercy to sinners, but you don't let it rub off on you. So you talk to someone now, your cursing and swearing bothers me a whole lot. You're talking about my Lord and Savior, okay? So you, t you talk about that. You show mercy. You show mercy, but you don't buy into their sin. I think that's what it says. Hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. You don't buy into their, to their sin, but you talk about it. Now, here's... Okay, David. Where's David? I'm almost done... Okay, get ready for those words. All right, so that's what we do, and here's what God does. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling. God is going to keep you from falling. He's that strong. He's been with you for the giving, for, from the beginning. He sees you're trying to walk the walk. He knows it's tough, and it's going to get tougher. Not only, as, not just as a citizen of this world, but as a citizen in his kingdom. And he's going to keep you from stumbling. And it applies to the congregation too. There's a lot of work we have to do here at Grace. And there's going to be plenty for the guy who comes and stays with you five or ten or fifteen years. Okay? But he's going to keep us from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. And then he ends with the doxology. To him who is able to do all these things, to the only God our Savior, be glory and majesty, power and authority. You know how you adore your grandchildren? And you eat them up? And you spend too much money on them? Anybody here do that? Hmm? Okay. And you just love him to death. You adore your grandchild. That's the way you feel about God because he is able to keep us. He's going to bring us home. Be glory, majesty. That's why we're going to sing Beautiful Savior at the end of the service, the last hymn of the year. Beautiful Savior, glory, laud, and honor to the beautiful Savior. Through Jesus Christ the Lord, before all ages, now forevermore. I think that's good news. Tough times, but good news. Good news. Homework for us and God's are busy at work. Keep us from falling. I'm done. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds on accessorizing yourself. And the really big one, God, who is able to keep you from falling until we see him in heaven. Amen. Let's rise. And